Shalom, welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabados of Dalmer, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. We have a very, very special guest with us today, Assemblyman David Weprin. David, welcome to the Jewish View, all the way from Queens to Albany. Well, of course, you're in Albany for the capital, but welcome to the Jewish View. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so uh, it's, I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, so I'm glad we had this opportunity. You have roots uh, to some extent in Albany. You went to SUNY Albany. I did. I went to SUNY Albany. I graduated in 1977, and actually um, the Shabbos house uh, was started by uh, Rabbi Israel Rubin, uh, during the time I was at um, mm -hmm. uh, SUNY Albany. So and a charter member. That's I right. guess a charter <laughs> member. And uh, we also had a kosher pizza shop uh, that uh, my roommate uh, was involved with at the time and uh, a kosher hot dog stand uh, that Capitol. my roommate was involved with at the, at, was right at the outside the Capitol. So that's, that's great. Now, we really can't uh, uh, gloss over the fact that you come from a prestigious family. Uh, your brother is in, was an assemblyman, he's now in the New York City Council, but even eclipsing that was the fact that your father was the assembly speaker and someone who I personally admired quite a bit, because he really had a lot, you know, integrity and you didn't have to worry about the, um, any uh, wrongdoing going on behind the scenes or anything. I mean, it's such a shame that he left us in such a young age, but... Uh, Thank you, know. you, I appreciate that. Yes, there has been a weapon in the assembly seat I represent, although the, the lines have changed a little bit over the years, but since 1971, uh, there's been a weapon. First my father uh, for 23 years, and then uh, my brother Mark uh, for almost 16 years, and I've been in the seat for a little over four years. Well, and uh, you came from the city council, and your brother went to the city council for your seat. You kind of switched seats because the, the New York City Council is term limited, and your brother, right. I went to college with your brother uh, at UAlbany, so we got we were friends before we were uh, at the Capitol, and I, uh, you know, he was just l looking to get back to New York City for personal reasons, so that was a good move for him and a good move for you because you're not term limited here. <laughs> uh, I guess that's uh, as it turns out, but uh, it's, it's not a, a body that I'm not familiar with uh, through uh, my father and mm -hmm. having been in SUNY. I also interned up here. Who'd you uh, intern for? Well, I started out, at my first uh, internship was with Assemblyman Joseph Lisa uh -huh. uh, from Queens, who later became a Supreme Court judge. Uh, and then I worked for um, Assemblyman Ed Lehner, who was head of the Housing Committee at the time. And who was still, who was in the Assembly back then that's still there now? Oh, a uh, number of people. Richard um, Gottfried? Uh, Gottfried is a senior member. He's, yeah. uh, he's been there since, um, he was since 1971. <laughs> um, and uh, Joe Lentil has been mm -hmm. there uh, since 1973. Yeah. Uh, Denny Farrell has been there since uh, 1975. So they were all here. Wow. And do you remind them that you were an intern when they were already senior members? I, I think they remember <laughs> that. I think they remember I was around. Um, and I actually also went into um, Governor Mario Cuomo's administration in 1983, so I spent a lot of time in Albany mm -hmm. uh, as Deputy uh, Superintendent of Banking uh, uh, for New York State. So I, uh, and when you were on the City Council, weren't you head of the Ways and Means or Budget Committee? Finance Committee. Finance correct. Committee. And I used to come up to Albany occasionally for that as well, but uh, you know, more so obviously when I was uh, an intern and, uh, and then also uh, when I was a Deputy in the Banking Department. Now, are you l looking to be on the Ways and Means Committee? Because you're not on there yet. No, I'm on the Banking Committee. Right. And I have been uh, since, since I've been in the Assembly. Well, and I'm on the Insurance Committee, because now, you know, right. they merged uh, the agency. Uh, it's no longer the Banking Department or the Insurance Department, but it's the uh, Financial, financial services. services Department. Right. So it's, it's an area that I've been involved in for a lot of years. And you're on Judiciary, and you're on Election Law, and Codes, and Cities Committee. Right. And you're on the Task Force on People with Disabilities. Right. I uh, just got appointed in January as chair of that chair, uh, okay. task force. Mazel tov. Thank you. Now, why... Was it, why is that important to you? You obviously choose committees that are close to you and important to you. Right. Well, the task force on people with disabilities is very important uh, because you know it's a very broad jurisdiction. Um, well, to you personally, I meant. Is well, I've been some... I've been involved um, in Any... issues of uh, helping uh, people with disabilities uh, going back to my city council days uh, when I was finance chair and we did uh, a lot of funding. Uh, for you know, accessibility for people in wheelchairs, for people with uh, physical as well as mental disabilities. 
Uh, it's an area, you know, of uh, very vulnerable uh, citizenry, uh, some uh, a class of people that really need governmental help. And uh, that's one of the most satisfying things about being in government is being able to help people uh, mm -hmm. that can't help themselves and, and really need uh, Do you that have government any, assistance. Anyone in your family is a person with disabilities? Or? Well, you know, I think we're all uh, a person with disabilities at one point or another in our lives. It's, sometimes it's temporary. Uh, and then, of course, as we all age, uh, we right. all, you know, uh, have certain disabilities uh, that come with age. So, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's very interesting you say that because Mark, of course, is our man in the Capitol, and we've had many assemblymen and senators here. And it just seems to me, and again, again, I, I consider myself the man in the street. I'm a rabbi. I don't, uh, I'm not a politician. But just listening to all of them, you know, people say, well, I want to go into social services and help people. And, of course, they do. And a lot of social services and things like that. But it seems to me that, the, you know, people in the government, you probably have a stronger role and a more position, you know, saying, well, I want to help people. People think, oh, politicians, you're there for the glory. I don't know what the person in the street thinks. But really, you're the most powerful social services people in the world. I mean, you know, just mm -hmm. in New York State. I mean, you pass a bill and to help people, it's more than any social worker can accomplish. You know, spending millions of dollars or helping people for this or that. It's interesting. To me, it's a new perspective, and I'm sure it is to many of our viewers, you know, that they don't understand really what politicians are and what you're doing. Yes, no, or you make a speech, but, I mean, it's powerful to change society and, and help people that way in a great role of helping people. You know, we'd like to try our best, and... Uh you know, I think you summed it up well. Uh, that's one of the areas that uh, we as elected officials uh, can really make a difference. You know, I wanted to get into some of the legislation that you're proposing that you have under your name. And there's something called the Religious Garb Act. Right. And I'm not sure if people understand that uh, there's discrimination based on the type of clothing people wear for religious purposes, for social purposes, whatever. So could you explain the bill a little bit? Absolutely. Um, it would apply to uh, not only uh, religious garb, uh, but facial hair as well. So it would obviously apply to the uh, Hasidic Jewish community. We actually had um, somebody that was supposed to, of the Hasidic uh, community in Brooklyn, uh, join the NYPD in New York City, uh, and they actually told him that uh, his beard had to be trimmed because it was too uh, long for their qualifications, and he actually had to uh, resign after going through training uh, with the police department. So obviously it would cover somebody like that. Well, at least he's a fit Hasidic Jew now. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to... I, would, I, would, I also um, have but, a large um, Indian American population right. in my district and a large Sikh community in Queens, mm -hmm. and it would be a very important bill to the Sikh community, because as you know, uh, Sikhs, as part of their religious beliefs, uh, have to have, uh, do, do not cut their hair, either their hair on their head or their uh, facial hair, right. and they wear turbans uh, that cover the, uh, the hair on the head. Uh, they're right. kind of like Nazirim in a sense, uh, that they, uh, they don't cut their hair at all uh, from birth, and uh, they've been discriminated against because uh, there are a lot of uniform agencies where yeah. they don't want them to wear the turbans or, or have the long beards. Well, they think there's something hiding in there besides hair. And, you know, it's a disclosure thing. But well, one example, actually, um, that's really significant uh, is there was somebody named Kevin Harrington, who was actually a convert to Sikhism. He was born uh, an Irish Catholic, Irish, yeah. uh, but converted uh, to Sikhism. He still uses Kevin Harrington. I think it's uh, Kevin Harrington S Singh, you know, because you take on Singh as the name, uh, or Kevin Singh Harrington, it might be. But um, Kevin Harrington was uh, a, a train operator for the MTA. And he actually drove the uh, E-Train um, into the World Trade Center on 9-11. And he actually was a hero during 9-11 because he actually rescued people from the burning buildings uh, by taking the train and driving it backwards uh, during 9-11. And he was uh, acknowledged and recognized uh, for doing that. But what happened was shortly after 9-11, there was a lot of discrimination against the Sikh community because of the beards and turbans mm -hmm. because they looked like Osama bin Laden. And people complained because he was very visible at the front of the train as a train operator. And uh, as a result of people complaining uh, from the public uh, that they didn't want somebody that looked like Osama bin Laden uh, driving a train and, you know, he might have been a terrorist, uh, they actually um, told him he could no longer operate the train and he had to go to the rail yards where he wasn't visible. 
uh, and he brought a lawsuit, and it took years and years, and they finally settled. But had my uh, bill been law at the time, uh, they could not discriminate against him because of his beard now, and turban. Now, when it comes to police officers uh, and beard, isn't that a safety issue? Well, for, my legislation does individual? allow. My legislation does allow uh, the employer. It, it doesn't have to. It could be a private employer as well as a public employer uh, to show um, an exception if they can show that someone cannot effectively do their job uh, with the religious attire. It's a tough burden to prove, and it switches the burden uh, to the employer. Because uh, we all know that in India, you have uh, Sikh um, you know, officers, right. police officers, firefighters, uh, mem members of the military, the prime minister yeah, but, uh, in India is a Sikh. But it's also like wearing a tie as, a, as an officer. They, they discourage that because it could be a, you know, used as a weapon and used to, to strangle you. And if a beard, you know, if the prisoner, you get in a scuffle, you pull the beard, I mean, there's all sorts, you know, you can have injury. Well, that, that's kind of far-fetched, No, I think. is it? I mean, I think that's... You can make that argument about any employment. You know, in well, the military, yeah. you know, we've had, um, you know, you can have, you know, Hasidic uh, officers in Israel in, in the military in, 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 in certain aspects. You know, uh, I know it's, it's a whole other issue. That's right, it's a whole other issue. <laughs> about, uh, you know, Haredi Jews uh, being, uh, being drafted. Uh, but I think even before that, you had a number of volunteers as well, uh, certainly in the case of, uh, you know, a war. So uh, we've had people with beards uh, in Israel and in the military and in all aspects. And in Rockland County, they got around it in Muncie. I think there is an uh, observant Jew uh, who's on the police force in Muncie or in Rockland County, maybe the county sheriff's office. But they got it. I don't know if you based, if you had a discussion with anyone in Rockland County about how they handled it. Well, look, I mean, how many police officers uh, have that? They have guns. <laughs> They're still going to carry a gun. Yeah. And uh, if somebody pulls your beard, you can pull the gun on them. It's not, you know, it's not... Uh, no, but did you have conversations with p folks in Rockland County to craft the bill and to see how other... Not really. I mean, I had a discussion with the NYPD. I had discussions with, um, with the MTA. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I, in some cases, certainly in the case of uh, Kevin Harrington and the MTA, it was just discrimination. Who's carrying the bill in the Senate? Uh, Senator James Sanders, also from Queens, who also has a large uh, Sikh population in but Richmond Hill, which I represent. Any Republicans? Um, he's getting co-sponsors now, but okay. uh, we actually passed the bill already in the Assembly with only one negative vote, passed with bipartisan support, Assembly, uh, Democrats and Republicans. Did the Republican? <laughs> first of all, who voted against it? Do you remember? Uh, I'd, I'd rather not say. Okay. He was, was a Republican member. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to single him out on, well, a, I'd on like a TV to. show. <laughs> I uh, want to know if we had him on the show or not. But anyhow, I wanted to uh, also find out, was there a long debate over this? Or was uh, it something that was... It was a little bit of a debate. A little bit of a debate. Okay. Because the Republicans like to debate everything. I mean, no matter what the point is, they just seem to get up and just want to... <laughs> bring bring is up there every a, point. A bill about adoption. That's what. I, yes, there because is. Because I have a, actually a adoptee's bill of rights. Yeah, right. And I was wondering oh. if you could talk about that. Absolutely. Uh, that bill actually has um, a lot of support in the assembly. We have, uh, I think, over eighty sponsors at this point, and you only need seventy six right. to pass a bill. So you would say, well, well just bring it to the floor; it's going to pass. But uh, unfortunately, it's always it's not always that simple uh, when you're dealing with the legislative process. But it, it's very simple. Um, and there have been, um, you know, a number of movies, most recently uh, Philomena, uh, that talks about uh, the need that a lot of adoptees have had to search for their birth parents and uh, for information on their heritage, uh, you know, uh, culture, religious background, but there are real medical reasons why. Right. One of, it basically, the bill would allow um, adoptees, when they become adults at the age of 18, uh, to uh, seek out and get a copy, a certified copy or a non-certified copy, because uh, the, the original birth certificate of the adoptee parents became their official birth certificate. So it's called a non-certified uh, birth certificate, but it would identify uh, their birth parents, their place of birth, uh, their religion if it was known, et cetera, um, at the time of 18 when it's requested. Right now, the health department still maintains those records in New York State, uh, but they're sealed. Uh, they're sealed at adoption, and an adoptee uh, doesn't have access to those. And a lot of adoptees, we had a hearing on January 31st, and we had extensive testimony uh, from, I think, about 38 witnesses in favor. There were only two against, um, and the two against were, were both judges, uh, 
that felt that it was it would take it out of the court system because right now you could seek um, your birth certificate uh, from the court system, but the uh, evidence has been from people that have tried to do that is it's routinely denied and it's very hard to show a burden uh, why you need your birth certificate. Well, genetics. Well, it's uh, medical and I have just a you know, personal story as being a rabbi. So one person came to me and he was a young man who's already 20 and he said that he was adopted by Jewish parents, which I says, well, according to, we're talking about Jewish Orthodox Torah law, and I says, well, we got to know your biological parents just because you're adopted by Jewish parents. And he had a birth certificate, or uh, not certificate, some certificate said the religion of his parents Jewish. I says, just not enough. We have to know who they are. And he even went to the court, exactly what you were just saying, and they said, well, we're not, it's sealed and we're not telling you. And, I, you know, we brought out the medical thing. Well, so what if it be medical, even though it was more religious, Jewish, and we really couldn't certify him as a Jewish person without knowing his real Jewish parents? And I'm just glad to see that, you know, that this would overcome that burden because this person was stifled. I mean, I said, we can't do anything about it. I mean, you know, the law is the law, like, just like uh, it is the civil law. I can't override Jewish law, of course. So, yeah, there was a real issue. So, so where is this bill it. held up? Where well, no, it, it actually uh, passed out of the health committee already. It's, uh, it's in the codes committee, uh, and we have um, extensive support from the hearing, and I'm hoping to move it um, sometime after the budget, hopefully be mm -hmm. before, before the, before end, the of end of the session. session. Mm -hmm. But talking about the medical issue, uh, one of our strong advocates is a woman, and she's very public, so I don't have a problem with uh, talking about her situation. Uh, her name is Jill Auerbach. She happens to be Jewish. Uh, but that's not really an issue in this particular issue. She's from Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, and she uh, had given up a child uh, for adoption. Uh, she was a teenage mother, uh, unwed, and she gave up the child, and she always wondered what would happen with him, and she later um, married um, the, the, her uh, you know, boyfriend, who was now her husband, uh, became her husband, uh, and he apparently died um, of a massive heart attack uh, in his early 40s, and uh, found out later that his father and uh, grandfather had also died of a massive heart attack in their 40s. And her son, that she, biological son that she gave up for adoption uh, 40 years ago, at the time, uh, was approaching the age of 40, and she wanted to warn him to get uh, see a cardiologist to get medical history, because he would have no way of knowing as a 40-year-old, healthy, young 40-year-old uh, male, that... Uh, that he was in danger of a ticking time bomb uh, of a potential heart attack. And actually, she hired a private investigator, spent thousands and thousands of dollars, located him in another state, uh, got him the medical information. He started seeing a cardiologist on a, on a regular basis, and she may have uh, saved his life. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's important when you go. That's why I always thought also just basically you go get a checkup. How old's your father? What did he die yeah. of? I mean, that's just now routine medical care, and if a person doesn't know a biological parent, like you say, here's a perfect case, but many times that's how doctors, you know, uh, oh, you had diabetes, grandfather, father had diabetes, okay, let's look out for you or put you on a diet. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what medically, that's how they do it. It's not just testing. They look at your background. So no, good job over here. So that's a good let, thing. Let's talk about your hazing legislation you have. It's, you call it Michael Deng's Law? Well, I hope it becomes Michael Deng's, Deng's law, and right now it's Michael Deng's bill. Okay. Um, Michael Deng was a Baruch College student, a constituent of mine uh, uh, from Bayside, oh. uh, and he was 19 years old, and uh, he was killed in a, in a hazing incident uh, uh, sometime the end of last year. I think it was last uh, December. I don't know if you remember the incident, no. uh, but it actually didn't even take place in New York State. It happened in Pennsylvania, um, and um, he was involved in a, a hazing incident where... Uh, it was in the cold and the snow, and he was asked to uh, be blindfolded and, and, and carry, uh, you know, sandbags, and, uh, you know, and then he was beaten, uh, and he, uh, he literally died. He, uh, you know, he had a, a heart, you know, a brain, mm -hmm. uh, you know, affected his brain, and... Uh, massive they, they, head injury. Yeah. Massive head injury, and, uh, you know, and he took him to the hospital, and he died. So my and, bill actually would not change the penalty for hazing, because there is still a a misdemeanor and a felony on the books now for hazing, but it would do is expand the definition of what is hazing. Right now, you have to um, have um, you know, the physical uh, contact with intent to cause harm or recklessly uh, 
you know, endanger someone uh, and cause harm. When you were in college, did you uh, join a frat? Uh, I did not. Because there were frats on there the were, campus. There were, a colonial quad. Yes. Uh, we had a lot of uh, fraternities, <laughs> but uh, I did not join that. Oh. I, I joined Hillel. Uh, there, there was no hazing. <laughs> no hazing except, for Hillel. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't how many like conditions that. can you eat over here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, how many, many, how much chillin contract. could you eat uh, in Shabbos? Uh, but, uh, it's the Jewish hazing over here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but my, my definition of hazing under this law, this legislation, would basically expand it to any physical contact uh, during an initiation ceremony. So there's no reason why you have to have physical contact. You can have a ceremony, you can have, uh, you know, I don't even mind if you have, uh, you know, a test, uh, you know, of uh, information or knowledge and pass a written test, uh, an oral test, but there's no reason why there should be any physical contact uh, you, in that ceremony. You have five children. I do. Do you? Uh, and three grandchildren. Okay, well then some of your children are not in college then. Are some of them in college? I have one that's still in college. Okay, and did you talk to him about hazing or her or and uh, about him. him, about frats and joining frats. And yeah, all that. he's at Queens College. It's not they're not uh, so big on, on fraternities, but he's not he's not a. <laughs> okay, a <laughs> um, so you would suggest that people don't join frats, or they no, just join? No, I didn't join, say that. No, I, no, I know you didn't. But I'm saying, or would you just say, you know, join a frat, but don't get into the physical part of hazing? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think uh, fraternities in general should be uh, involved in. In physical hazing uh, rituals, that's really what it is. I mean, there could be other initiation ceremonies that don't involve uh, physical contact. Because once you're dealing with uh, physical contact and a ceremony, uh, you don't know where it's going to lead and where it's going to. And go. at the SUNY Albany, there was a uh, uh, death of, because of hazing on Indian Lake outside of Indian Quad, where a student voluntarily wasn't mandatory, but voluntarily went into the water of Indian Lake, and there was some electric current that was running through, and the university was held liable for the student dying by his foot hitting that electrical outlet. And the physics department had done tests in that lake years before and told the school administration that they found current coming through, a light current coming through the water, and the university didn't do anything for years until this death. Wow. Occurred. So that was a multi million dollar settlement. But of course, there's no money on life that you, know, you could put on a life. So Correct. that was uh, something in our own backyard that happened at SUNY. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the academic boycott bill, which I think a lot of people have jumped, SUNY and a lot of other places have jumped on the bandwagon to uh, apply pose what the, this group wants to boycott. Explain the whole thing. It's, uh... Yeah, it, it's um, kind of an academic uh, uh, professors, uh, you know, uh, on different uh, campuses, and there's a, a part of a movement to, uh, uh, to boycott Israel or Israeli goods uh, because of what they consider uh, a mistreatment of, the, uh, of, of Palestinians, which is obviously, as we know, uh, is not true at all. Israelis... Uh, uh, treat the Palestinians uh, much better uh, than the Palestinians were treated in the Arab countries, and uh, certainly um, there's more democracy in, in Israel and, uh, and 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 human rights, uh, you mm -hmm. know, not violated uh, under Israeli rule as there is in a lot of the um, you know Arab countries. So that's that's a fact, actually. And uh, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. But there is this um, intellectual movement uh, to have some comparison between. Uh, you know, Israel uh, and the Palestinians and apartheid in, uh, in South Africa. So there's a movement uh, to boycott uh, Israel, which uh, in and of itself, uh, you know, is, is outrageous. And what we, we're saying in this legislation is that um, they should not get government funding uh, to participate in a boycott of any country, really. But uh, in this particular case, uh, it's, uh, it's Israel. Is every Jewish assembly person on here? I'm really bill. not sure. I don't know. Because I sure look at sure. this and I see that, you know, there's a lot of co-sponsors for the bill. Uh, the bill is carried by the Speaker of the Assembly. Correct. But uh, what's the, there's a multi-sponsor. John McDonald's a multi-sponsor. What's the difference? Explain to the audience the difference between a co-sponsor and a multi-sponsor. Well, they're both sponsors. Uh, <laughs> you know, they consider a co-prime and a, a multi-sponsor. It's just, it's just a, a different paragraph. You know, but why have that, why have the distinction? Is it 
does it mean anything? Does it? But, you know, my attitude is, uh, when I sign on to bills, is that I very rarely are, are a multi-sponsor. I'm either a, a co-prime sponsor or not a sponsor at all. Uh, because, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, being um, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit in support. It's, it's you know, if I'm going to support something, right. I'm going to support it all the way. So I generally don't sign on as multi-sponsors. Other people feel that if they're multi-sponsors, they're not... Uh, as actively involved, possibly, uh, okay. you know, in, in promoting the legislation. And, and with this bill, this boycott bill, New York Civil Liberties Union is opposing it uh, aggressively. So, I mean, how do you deal with them when they come to your office and they try to lobby you or advocate? Well, you know, I, I say, uh, you know, I, I respect the uh, American Civil Liberties Union on, on a lot of their positions. But, for example, I remember when they uh, took a very strong stand in favor of Nazis march, marching in Skokie, Illinois, uh, right outside of Chicago, a Jewish suburb, we had a lot of Holocaust survivors at the time. And, you know, I think there's an exception. You know, I'm a lawyer. You learn in law school, you know, uh, there is such a thing as First Amendment and free speech, but that doesn't give anybody a right to shout uh, fire in a crowded theater. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's case law that we've learned in law school, you know, by uh, the Nazis marching in Skokie with uh, a very large uh, Holocaust survivor population at the time. In my opinion, that was uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater. Now, this, the, this boycott was brought upon by the uh, American Studies Association. Correct. A group of mostly professors, right? Professors. So they were Jewish professors? or Some just, might have been. Some might have been. But okay. they, don't, they weren't all Jewish So what's professors. the status now of this uh, boycott? Or? Well, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a small percentage, and I think uh, there have been people very vocal, you know, against the boycott, uh, you know, singling out, uh, ironically, uh, the only country that's a democracy in the entire region, in the entire Middle East. I mean, if you think about it, why aren't they boycotting uh, all these surrounding countries uh, that have human rights violations on a regular basis that, you know, treat their own population, uh, you know, improperly? Right. I mean, it seems kind of uh, ironic that they're singling out uh, the only democracy in the Middle East. So l let me just ask you, uh, we started off talking about the pizza place, and we talked <laughs> about the, f the hot dog stand outside the Capitol. How do you, as an observant Jew, survive in Albany? I've asked this of other observant Jews who've been on the show, so I'm not just singling you out. But how do you survive in Albany here with food and provisions? Do you bring stuff up from home? And Occasionally, you also have a, a whole kosher section, a price chopper. Uh, you know, and there's there's plenty of other stuff you can manage. Uh, you know, uh, you know d certain dairy products and uh, you know another. It's not things. that bad in Albany. <laughs> it's not here. that bad, but I just wanted to. <laughs> you know, what I'm trying to do is we is actually have a, a members' lounge where we have right. uh, a, a lot of kosher products. Uh, yeah, fruits know, and yogurt. Other like and, that, yeah. Uh, but I just wanted, you know, like Angelo Mazzone, who has Mazzone Hospitality, they took over all the eateries in the concourse. And I was talking to him about providing kosher food. And he was right on it because he knows the industry. He knows a lot about it. And he has staff who knows a lot about it. So he was like, oh, I'm making that phone call. I'm going to do it because I told him we have more observant Jews now than we've ever had before in the legislature. That's true. So, you know, so you... I think it's time to uh, reopen the uh, pizza stand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, when um, Shelley Silver was first here as an assembly member, be well, well before he was speaker, uh, he used to eat in the pizza shop every night, he told me, when he was uh -huh. up here. So, but you're doing fine with eating, you're not... Uh, yeah, I'm managing. Okay, I'm, you're managing. <laughs> okay. All I'm right. starving over here. We don't want you to start. <laughs> well, it's not that bad in Albany over well, here. No. I don't want people to get the wrong image. It, I, I don't either, thinking. but I just wanted to show Angelo that there is a need, that the legislators really do want more choice and, and they, that he should really push this m further. So I was trying to get your More is take on that. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I think you should give him a... All right. We always give a blessing, but um, <laughs> yeah, you've been doing great work. You started with the, the assembly from your roots. But like I say, there's so many things that not only for, of course, the Jewish community, the observant Jewish community, but, but the whole state, you know, all these laws are really helpful for everybody. You're doing a great work and continue with success and even more advancement and, of course, everything with good health. Yes, okay, absolutely. Okay, and Chag Kasher V'Sameach, Aziz and Pesach, uh, to, uh, to all your viewers. Thank, Thank you. you.